third-party inspection services in China, the disaster that led me to them, my go-to company for this service, why they are important, and my favorite three inspection types all in this episode. Let's get to it. Welcome back to the Wizards of Amazon podcast, your weekly blueprint for explosive success. I'm Carlos Alvarez, full-time successful Amazon seller and organizer of the largest Amazon seller meetup group in the world. Let's do this. All right. So I want to begin this letting you guys know a little bit about what third-party inspection services are in case any of my listeners don't know and how I ran into them. So third-party inspection services are are your team or, or your tool to have inspections done on your behalf in a country or location that you can't reach. Different third-party inspection services specialize in in different functions. If it's a chemical product, you want to find out if you can locate a, or you want to find rather, an inspection company that specializes in working with chemical products. Likewise, electronics, porcelains, you get the idea. Now, my company of choice for this is V-Trust. That's V as in Victor, Trust, V-Trust. And I'll get a little, min- a little bit more into how long I've been working with them, why I like working with them later in the episode. Now, my, my first experience working with China and, and how I learned about uh, the need or, or the danger of not using a third-party inspection service looks something like this. Approximately 12 years ago, uh, I went full-time with selling on Amazon. And I was, you know, I was transitioning from eBay. I was full of excite, uh, full of excitement on how my products on eBay that didn't move, I could just put them on Amazon and they would fly. So when I actually started putting products on Amazon that were my winners, you can, as you already know, if you're listening to this podcast, you're, you're an Amazon seller, you know how the rest of that story went. And 12 very successful years later, um, here we are. So I'm full of excitement. Um, at the time, I had just gotten into my first white label or for, for lack of a better description, private label product, as we would call it today. And I, I thought at the time that I was the only one that discovered Alibaba or that knew of Alibaba. Uh, mind you, at this time, there was no Facebook groups for, you know, Amazon selling where we could brainstorm, share ideas, warnings, anything like that. So I really had no resource to go to and, and, and bounce ideas off of. All I knew is that there was this one company, I believe the company's name was Pleasure Chest and my rep at the time name was Elvis. Yeah, that was a real story, Elvis. And, I was buying these these adult novelties. They were actually this this ring that a guy puts on, and I'll let your imagination do the rest. And there was this little motor. You get it. And I I had no money at the time, but I was buying these things for about sixteen cents a box, and uh, they would sell out. You know, I'd sell forty or fifty of them a day on eBay, and they would sell for about nineteen dollars for like a two pack. So. I was maxing out what my supplier, Pleasure Chest, actually had on hand. And and in my ignorance, I I thought that it was just an endless supply. I imagine a a warehouse as far as the eye can see, just with pallets and pallets of this stuff just sitting here. So that that was me and my ignorance. So, well, at that same time, my my family and friends are seeing me now. Uh, Mind you, at this time, I'm juggling uh, a sub shop delivery job. I'm working full-time in Publix. I'm in union school to become an air-conditioned refrigeration tech. I'm doing my eBay business at night. I'm transitioning into Amazon. And little by little, I'm starting to drop some of these jobs, these real jobs. I'm doing air quotes here. And putting more and more focus on my eBay and Amazon business. So my family saw this and saw this as like a, a real career path. Like, like, wow, let's support Carlos here. Let's, let, let's all get together, get some money and give him some, something that he could really do some damage with. So my friends and family wind up getting together. Um, I, I'd say about $81,000 as a matter of fact, I'm almost positive it's $81,000. So what did I do naturally is I went straight to my supplier for the product that gave me the highest return and who I've been maxing out the products, the units that I'm getting per day or the amount, the, the amount of inventory I could get per day, rather, I would sell out. So I couldn't keep it in stock is what I'm saying. So I looked at this as, okay, well, I have over $80,000 now. I'll probably get, you know, 70 something thousand dollars in inventory and the rest will go to shipping and whatnot. So I contact Pleasure Chest and I let them know. I'm like, look, I'm going to try to talk slow here too. I'm told I'm, I'm told I can talk fast, but I, I contact Pleasure Chest and I let them know, uh, look, I want to place an order for $80,000 worth of this product. So 
obviously, Pleasure Chest did not have that kind of inventory in stock. It's normal. Factories are not accustomed to just stocking inventory. You know, it's mass mass manufacturing made to order. Now, I took this as, uh, I took offense. I took offense believing in, in ignorance that the factory was saying, you know, we're not taking you serious. We're not going to sell you that many products. So I got upset. I looked in other spots on Alibaba, told them I'd never deal with them again. And I looked for someone that was a, again, air quotes here, serious factory, ready to work with, you know, the next Bill Gates, if you will, and totally full of myself. And I, I found one. It was perfect. I don't recall, or I would totally put this person out there, but I don't recall the name of the business or factory page on Alibaba. All I know is the, the owner who was also talking to me as the, as the rep, which should have been a red flag right there. His name was Usman Cisse. And Usman let me know that he had exactly what I was looking for. He showed me a picture of the products sitting in a box. Now, now this could have been found on Alibaba. And when you hear the end of this story, you'll, I think you'll appreciate the, the, the level of ignorance that I had at the time. I, I said, oh, wow, he, he actually has a picture of the product. Um, he must have it. So I told him I wanted to place an order for $80,000 and I sent him everything. Um, it was It was just shy of $80,000. And obviously it was all in stock. So it wasn't putting a down payment, getting it mass produced. Once it's finished, sending the remaining balance. No, this was all in stock. First time we're doing an order together and I sent him the money and he disappeared. He totally disappeared. He stole everything from me. And at the time, I had no idea that that could even happen online. It was like the bubble that I was in. To date, my experiences on eBay were amazing, like absolutely amazing. So to think that this had just happened, I I, I was with disbelief. So I go straight to Google, which I probably should have done initially, and I start looking up, someone took my money on Alibaba, what to do, a search like that. And Pages upon pages of information came back. And and I don't want to scare anybody away saying, don't use Alibaba. It's nothing but a ripoff. That's not the case. In this podcast, in these in these shows that we have in this podcast, we're going to cover all kinds of different platforms like Alibaba, 1688. We're going to go through all that. But for for this episode, I lost everything. As a matter of fact, the the Usman Cisse popped up a couple weeks later and sent me an email. And I I remember I would check my phone all night thinking this is a mistake. Maybe something in his family happened. And I finally saw an email from him one night. I almost broke my leg getting out of bed. Uh, He was asking me for more money, pretty much saying, hey, I haven't heard from you. You sent the money. I got this stuff ready to ship. If you don't send me the money, there's demurrage fees and, and, and yada, yada, yada. And I was so desperate. I almost sent more money. But at that point, I had really done a lot of research on Google. I had looked on Alibaba forums and saw that this was an actual thing. You know, all of this could have been avoided. A simple Google search would have exposed this, this factory. You know, he said he had a factory in Hong Kong. Factories are not in Hong Kong. They're in mainland China. A simple Google search, uh, Google Earth search would have exposed this person as not being who they say or having a factory as they say. So ignorance is bliss. Or in this case, I I wind up pivoting and and starting the amazing businesses and brands that I've grown over the years, which we'll talk about in other episodes. But in in this case, I I lost everything and I was accustomed to being broke, but I wasn't, I wasn't yet done with people seeing me as a successful seller. So I used that fuel to drive me into starting other brands and, and other like amazing successes on Amazon. Now, the second thing I needed to do later on, once I built my capital back up was to make sure that something like this would never happen again. I vowed that something like to myself, I vowed that something like this would never happen again. And I began compiling a list uh, first in my head and later on paper of all the different things that I could do uh, short of just being total, totally paralyzed by paranoia that I can do to vet a factory. And I was doing all this and, and then I stumbled across on Alibaba, of of all things, um, third-party inspection services. And from that point forward, if I ordered anything from a factory, I involved a third-party inspection service into that process. Now, I've worked with hundreds, uh, literally hundreds of third-party inspection companies. And the one uh, years ago that I finally settled on and that I, I just pretty much refused to work with anyone else but them because they 
they run the whole gamut of inspections from the chemical to the electronic to anything. Uh, they can do it in China and Vietnam or just Asia in general. And that company is VTrust. Another thing that I really like about VTrust is inspections are not an add-on service with them. And what do I mean by that? There's a lot of prep companies and sourcing agents and, and the like over there that while, while they provide a very valuable service, inspections are kind of like an add-on for them, kind of like, this is something else you need, an upsell. I might as well offer this. It can't be that hard. And and I beg to differ. I've I've worked very closely, and when you work with a company for so long, you get to know all the people, you develop a relationship, you get to really talk to them. And I've done this with David over there in VTrust. And I know there's a whole lot more to it. This is not just an add-on line item. This is a major service that requires heavy lifting. So I don't want to keep rambling. I'm long-winded about this. I love what I do. I love inspections. I love PL. I love ordering from China. I love selling on Amazon. So I'm going to get right into the meat and potatoes of why I believe you are listening to this episode. And that is my three most important inspection types when working with companies in China. Number one, starting from the most important, and I tried to structure these in a way that made sense for when you would bring them or when you would deploy them in the relationship or in the order process with the factory. So so number one is the full factory audit. This is probably going to be the most expensive service type offered by your third-party inspection company. Factory audits do everything. So I learned the improv, like why spend that much money on a factory? Okay. So even if you can verify with a couple dollars that the factory exists, that does not mean you're safe in just sending them money. What happens if the order you're going to place is $100,000, $200,000, or we don't even have to go that big? What if your budget to start is only a few thousand dollars and it feels like a million dollars to you? So if you're going to make that kind of investment with a company and they're giving you a you know, 30, 45, 60, 90 day lead time, what's to say that they don't go bankrupt before your mass production is over. What what if they're just taking in a a lot of new orders knowing that they're not going to be able to fulfill their side of the order? So a full factory audit exposes, you know, the finances of the factory, how stable they are, other, other important things like do they have an export license? Is the factory in good standing? Do they have a quality inspection team? How long have they been in business? Are they a trading company or a factory? Much more on that in in other episodes. Anything you could possibly think of. Another uh, item in the full factory audit that that I really like is about the machinery. So you're getting pictures and video, if you want, of all the machinery and the whole layout of the factory. And the lifespan of a machine that manufactures products is limited. So that's not to say you can't push it a little bit past the life span of the of the machine but if you're working with a factory and you need some precision made products you know you don't want these little defects remember on amazon one percent you lose your you lose your listing like you just your listing is suppressed so that's not an even an acceptable margin there if we're if they're working with machines to do your orders that have a lifespan of 10 years and they've been around 20 that's a problem. That's something that's probably going to make you give pause on placing this order. Or w- what if the factory says that they can manufacture 50,000 pieces per month, but they're working with one machine and it's 10 years old? That's something I really want to know before placing an order. So, so full factory audits are extremely important. I, I deploy these in the beginning of the relationship. And what that looks like is once we, we develop a, a good back and forth on WeChat and the suppliers getting to know me and what I'm looking for. And, and we have price to a point that we both agree. Uh, we always want it lower, right, as sellers, but we have it at a price that we believe is fair and competitive. And it's time to start talking about the purchase agreement and everything you want to include there. I have an episode on purchase agreements coming up that I believe will blow your mind. And it's totally different than what anybody else is doing. But before you start getting into the purchase agreement and start investing more money and time, you definitely want to bring in the full factory audit. And I just let them know, look, company policy is that we prov- uh, we conduct a full factory audit on uh, your factory before doing business. And the inspection company we use is, and then insert the fact the, the inspection company that you're using. Again, I like VTrust. So you'd say, we use VTrust. 
I noticed from experience that if you tell them that, sometimes they'll be like, uh, no, 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 we, we don't, we don't do that. And what they're, what they're thinking is that you're expecting them to pay for an inspection on their company. So to avoid any misunderstanding, let them know that you're going to cover the cost and that you're going to be creating an email thread with the third party inspection company in it so that they can coordinate the best time to go by. Usually the factories will will move mountains to make it as fast as possible so that we can get past the inspection stage and actually move on with the placing of the order. So get that one done in the beginning for a full factory audit, especially if you're placing any value in developing a relationship or Wangji in a long-term cooperation with a factory in China. My second one is random inspections. So This is important. An experience I had with random inspections is I told factories that, look, we already got past the full factory audit. They were actually impressed and took me a lot more serious since I brought an inspection company in and actually paid for it. It was a way to check a bunch of boxes on my end as well as show them, look, I'm willing to put some skin in the game here. So they were so impressed by it that I was exploring other options. I think the first time I had never done a random inspection, but I wanted to kind of dazzle them with how serious I was. And and I let them know, look, um, we occasionally do random inspections. So once I placed the order, I contacted VTrust, but you know, you know, 15, 20 days into a a 60 day lead time. And I said, look, um, go by the factory and do a random inspection. They already know that I do random inspections. So Long story short, I wind up hearing back from the trust letting me know that they couldn't do the inspection. They were refused entry into the factory. So I contact the factory thinking the worst and the factory tells me, oh no, we told them they could come in, but we need six or seven days notice. And I said, wait a minute, like this totally defeats the purpose of a random inspection. You know, six or seven days notice. I don't know what's going on right now. I don't want you to pause mass production until I can get people in, but I also want to know what's going on at this stage of mass production. So I needed to include that in my purchase agreement. Again, an extremely important episode is coming up soon in this podcast for purchase agreements. And this particular part is very important. And, and that is letting the factory know what you mean by a random inspection. And that when you declare a random inspection, they need to allow access during working days within 24 hours of when you declare it. So random inspections is a very important one for me. I re- I try to use them all the time, but I definitely use them anytime I'm developing a product that has internal components that I feel like in my next inspection type can't be adequately inspected without destroying the product before shipping. So number three, final, uh, final favorite of my inspection type, but definitely not the only inspection types there are by third-party inspection companies, and that is the pre-shipment inspection. This inspection type, as you can probably deduce from the name, is the typical way this works is you put a down payment, you start mass production of your order. Be, when mass production is done, especially if you don't have um, you know a great relationship yet with the factory and a bunch of orders under your belt, they're going to require the remaining balance, the 60 or 70% remaining balance that you have not paid for the order, paid to them before they release it and send it off to, you know, the shipyard or you're having it picked up depending on your terms, whether it's FOB or XWorks, but they like to say it upon sight of bill of lading. So they they basically in short, they want to be paid before they get rid of the products, obviously. Now you're in a dilemma. You're, you're all the way in your home. You're in another country and you don't know if the quality of the products at mass production meet, you know, your agreed upon standards in your samples or, or what you have in your mind. And, you're nervous to send the remaining balance because they see the product and they get the money. You haven't seen any products, but you're sending the money. So pre-shipment inspections help with that. That means when all the products are done and they're packaged and they're ready to be shipped, you can call in a pre-shipment inspection and the inspection company will grab a, a random per- a percentage of products already packaged randomly through all of them. You know, They don't just grab the first ones in the pallet that's most convenient for them. They'll grab random products and they'll inspect them. The tests are extremely thorough. The inspection reports that you get are a good 20, 30 pages. And what's even more important here in this pre-shipment inspection is that you include any other specific information that you feel they may not be looking for. An example of this, uh, one of my products uh, was a gooseneck induction style coffee kettle and 
what the major problem we saw on Amazon was is that the actual kettle handle started bending. And when it would bend and you're holding it full of hot water, the kettle body is very hot. And when you held it like that, it would burn your hand. So we, we were able to figure out all these different negative reviews that were given for this product. And we wanted to make sure in the inspection that they were not going to happen to us. So we asked them to fill the product, full, fill the actual kettle full of ball bearings, water, heat it up, hold it, make sure it doesn't heat up too much uh, against the hand. Just you get the idea. So you, you figure out what your weak spots are of your product, usually based off what your negative reviews are of your competitors and make sure they're included in your pre-shipment inspection. Okay. So a little bit more about what to expect from reports. And I want to wrap this episode up and I try to keep these episodes in the 20 to 30 minute range. And this is an episode in and of itself on how to inspect a report. But I want to let you know something on just one definite thing that you're going to probably be shocked about when you're receiving your first report. And that is, you know, using a grade scale of like A to F, A being good, F being bad. I have never seen a report graded with an A. Initially, that freaked me out until I started looking at inspections of just local restaurants here in the United States or in Miami, Florida, where I live and realize very rarely do they see, receive A's either. You know, the job of an inspection company is to dive deep and find everything, the tiniest flaws everywhere. And, and that's not to say that even after a grade of a C or a D, that it means you should not order it and that, you know, the factory sucks. That's not the case. What it is, is it's the factory wanting to provide you all the details you need to be armed with making a purchase and, and let you decide if, you know, A, B, and C here are big enough of a problem that before paying, I want to get fixed or no, that's minor. That's actually standard in all the products. Let's proceed. So that's something that was a huge shock for me when I first saw an inspection report. And I, and I believe it will be for you too. And uh, with that, I want to wrap up this episode. Uh, I want you to know that we're, we covered a lot of information here, things like purchase agreement, inspection companies, how best to deal with them, how best to have that conversation and communicate between the actual factory, your factory that you want to work with and this third party inspection company, how to gel that together without the factory thinking that you don't trust them or it's some kind of trust issue. We're going to cover all that kind of stuff in a lot more in future episodes, but I'm going to wrap this up here. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode and I look forward to chatting with you next week. Liked what you heard and want to stay connected? Join our Facebook group or find me anywhere on social media at Wizards of Amazon or text the word Amazon to 69922.